Welcome to another Just Name It Challenge. It's Challenge 5 of Season 3 and we're going to build another dashboard and it's going to be a geospatial visualization. So we are visualizing data on a world map. This week's challenge is about analyzing survey results to the LGBTQIA community. You can read the exact task yourself. The overall goal is to use a map to present the results effectively. Before I show you the exact workflow, let's have a quick look at what the outcome looks like. It's a component, so after opening it, there are three sections. The top section shows two selection widgets, one for the answer given to the survey and one for the subgroup that ends at the survey. And whenever we change to then the visual, it's automatically update. The first visual is a map which shows for the selected subgroup and the selected answer to the percent of people in every country that gave that answer. And when we hover over, you see the number in percent. The second and last visual is more of a map. It's another map type of view. However, here for every country there's a pie chart where we can inspect the distribution of the answers given by the selected subgroup. That's why also this visual is not filtered by the answer given. Let's now open up the component. No surprise, we start with reading the data. It's a CSV file that I've saved to the data folder in my workflow so that we can read it from the current workflow data area. And after reading the file, we add a filter straight away. The task was to analyze this question. This question has this unique question code B1 underscore A. So we use row filter to test the question code column was a value B1A and we keep any row that include that value. Next, it's time to remove some irrelevant columns so we know what the question is. We don't need the question code. And at the end, there's also a notes column that we don't really need. So in the column filter, we remove all of those. And then it's time to take care of some data formatting. The value column, the percentage column is currently type string. We need that um, as a double or as a number. So we use string to number to convert that. After looking at the outcome, we can see is missing values. Uh, which is no good when we check the table before the conversion to understand what was in there we notice that there were these colons in there we don't really know why or what that means but that doesn't really help our analysis so we use missing value note to remove any rows with a missing value and that's simply done by uh, saying remove the rows where you find a missing value in any column that is of type double which now matches our percentage column. After that, it's time to do some sanity checks to start with because we've removed some rows. I wanted to make sure that there's still um, for any combination of country and subset all five answers present in the data set. And I also want to check that the sum uh, for every country and subgroup in terms of percentage adds up to 100 plus minus 2. For that, I use a group by node. Uh, we group by country code and subset, and then we um, go to manual aggregation and aggregate the sum of the percentage column, and we get the count of the answer column. When we open up the table, we can do a quick check by using the sort button. So first I sort descending the percentage column, so the highest value is 102. Then I sort ascending the lowest value is 98 so that's exactly that uh, 100 plus minus 2 which means that there are some rounding differences in the answers i do the same check for the count and given that the table doesn't really change that means that the count is always five so that's good next given that we want to visualize countries on the map i check what's what unique countries we have so that's also a group by node where we group by country and we don't have any aggregation. So the output is a list of countries. 
And when we check that list, it's all countries except for the second row, which says average. Given that average is not a location, we will remove that in the next step. At the stage when billing that, I wasn't 100% sure whether I wanted to do anything with the average data. That's why I used a row splitter and not a row filter. And I've configured that to check the country code column for the value average and to exclude any rows that have average in them. And in the context of a row splitter, that means that anything in average goes to the top port, so the top triangle, which you can see here, access here, what was the countries, and anything that's executed doesn't just vanish like in a row data, but goes to the bottom triangle output port, which you can access in here. So here we have all the averages. In the end, I decided not to use the averages, but to just proceed with the country data. If we follow the connections, the next node is a group by node at the bottom. So given that I wanted some sort of user interactivity, I needed to extract the options that the user can choose from in the drop-down widgets. So for that, I always use a group by node without any group columns, just with manual aggregation. And I put in the answer and the subset column twice, once to generate a set. So a set are the unique values uh, in a special format that we can later use to pass to the widgets as a flow variable. And then for both, I also get the first value. The first value I always take to uh, be in a position to define a default value. And that's important to ensure that if someone just executes your component for the first time without having made a choice, that it doesn't run in two errors, but execute smoothly. With these uh, sets and firsts are then passed to the user input component. User input component has the layout for our two dropdowns. And if we dive into that component, we immediately turn our input, which are the sets and the firsts, into variables, flow variables, and pass these flow variables to our widgets. Let's look at the answer widget as an example other than giving it the right label. And so forth, on the flow variables or possible choices, we take the set of possible answers. And on the default value up on expand, you can see that the first answer I've uh, put in there to make sure that it always executes. And the last thing that I've chosen to do is to use the re-execution functionality. And so on the re-execution tab, I tick this box, and that makes sure that whenever the value of ease of these widget changes, then the workflow re-executes and the version is updated. We merge both chosen values into one variable stream so that we have the selected subset and the selected answer in one variable stream. And I here took the opportunity to just add two variables, which is question that we've asked, was it reanalyzing and then the subheading. So the subheading will be the combination of the selected subset and the selected answer, which we can later on see in that first map view. That's very simple, just adding two variables, giving them the names. And the question one is just uh, between quotation marks, a question copied in. And for the subheading one, it's just combining the two variables with a dash in between. So this then goes to the component output. Whenever you pass variables into a component or out of a component, Always make sure that you uh, check that they also are available outside the component. You do that by going to the component output, clicking on configure, making sure that any variables that you want to use outside the component is in the green include box. So by default, they are always in the red execute box. That's also why a lot of times when you start building a massive workflow and then tidy it up at the end and break it down into components, that uh, it may fail when you execute it for the first time, because in any components, the variables are on the execute side first, and you need to move them to the include side to make things work. This way, the same on the component input side, so whenever passing variables to components, so that you can use them, you need to move them from the default red to the required green, so that the variables are available. That's it, let's go back to the maps tab. So next, we pass these two variables to two root-based row filter to filter the data set for the two maps. The first root-based row filter is filtering for subset and answers. And the way that's done is we take the subset column and select only those that meet the selected value. 
and we then check as well the answer column and only uh, keep those that meet the selected value. So this is connected by an and, and only where this condition is true will keep the values. I really like the robust row theta because you literally can just uh, do most of it with clicks. So subset equals selected subset, and even the end you can do, and answer equals selected answer, and the only thing that you need to do yourself is a true bit. But it's really easy to build your, your logic here. So this then goes to the map. Before we check the map, let's quickly see what the other robust row figure does. Almost does the same with the exception that the end condition is missing. We are only filtering for the subset because we want to keep all answers for all countries and subsets in the second map view. So for the first map view, I stumbled across this uh, chloroplast map component that was pre-built. So thanks to whoever has spent the time to build this, it makes it really easy to visualize data on a map course you have this nice configuration dialog. What I did is I used the flow variables that I created earlier on for the chart title and for the uh, subtitle. So the subtitle is this, the selected group and the selected answer and the title is always a question of the variables that we've created earlier and other than that you really just have to snag the theme, tell the node in which a uh, column the country the information is what is the value column and so on and then you get very quick and be neat output. No, no, let's follow the path of the upper robust row filter. We pass it data into a component that keeps our other map with the pie charts and I stumbled across this map in the solution of Sphero 4 challenge 4. So from last week's challenge and he really found a, a neat solution that I never thought about um, when trying to make e-charts maps work for me. Of course, in the example, it's, uh, there's also some JSON loaded from their website, and I didn't really have an idea how to do that. He simply uses a GET request node to get the JSON, and then also passes it to the component. So that just gives us one row with a JSON ob object in it, in this JSON object contains information about countries, for example, here Somalia and then the coordinates that we need in the maps. For looking into the detail of the component, a quick excursion to Apache charts. So you can see this is CUL where you find more details around each charts in general, and by clicking on examples you get a lot of examples that you can do with each charts. We are looking at GeoMap, and I believe that this one is the example that what we've built is based on. As you can see at the top here, some JSON file is being pulled, and there seems to be one for a world map as well, which uh, you can be found and pulled by a get request node. We'll look into that next. So both of this is passed to this component, and what we then do is with our country data, so that the bottom port, we reset the row ID. So the reason we are doing that is to make sure that there's also a row zero, because what we need to do to make the JSON available to our view in the end is to join, join it in. And to, uh, given that we can only join on row really, uh, we need to make sure that there's always a row zero. So the join us in, it's very simple. We join on row ID and we pull in the JSON. And that means that we get only in row zero the JSON object, which just is all right. We can access it there within the eChucks view. And after that, there's one more tidy up thing to do. I did a lot of debugging to make this work for me. And the very tiny error was that um, the JSON had written check rep or check republic in it, so shortened it, whereas my data set contained check republic written in foil. So this column expression just checks uh, the country code if it's check republic and if it is it replaces the value otherwise it just takes whatever value is in the column currently. 
So then we pass it to the eCharts view. I'm not going to walk through the exact code, but what I want to show you is how you can do some debugging yourself. It's open the lab. The way that you can debug in the eCharts view is by using the console log command. And just quickly do a simple example. Um, as part of the processing in here, the serious data object is being compiled. And as you want to check that out, you can simply type console lock and in brackets and put in that object. So to start with, we'll use the length of the object and then it refreshes and tells us that there are 26 records in the data set. Well, if I remove that length bit, then I just get the raw output. And that's exactly how I got to the bottom of this originally. And uh, when I couldn't really work out what was wrong, I actually went down here where we uh, iterate over this object to create the different inputs for the chart. I used square brackets here, and square brackets allow you to pick one of the entries. So it's zero based, so zero would be the first entry. So now you can see we only have one country, one is the second, and so on. And the fifth country, so in next the math bar was Czech Republic. And that was the one that did, didn't visualize. So when I realized that, I inspected the JSON, saw the difference in how Czech Republic was represented there, and that then led me to the solution to replace it. So let's now remove that again, and I think we'll keep it at that for now. So that's my solution and the walkthrough. Hope you enjoy it, and I see you next time.